Jody? Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another webinar uh, from NM Law, the series uh, designed to empower the community and answer questions um, during this pandemic and time of change. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Samantha Smith. She's an attorney at NM Law and a native of Orange County. Samantha has been with the firm for about four years and has been practicing law for six. Samantha's practice primarily focuses on trust litigation and administration, probate proceedings, and estate planning. Today, Samantha is presenting on ways to mitigate the risk of COVID-19, narrowing the focus to four strategies to protect the real property interest of individuals and families. As we round out the year, it is an unclear to what extent, if at all, home and real property owners will be provided some measure of protection as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. As many in our nation and community face unemployment and other strains on income, concerns about paying mortgage rent and other expenses are increasing too. This enabling environment raises other concerns, including inheritance related to tax liability, staying out of probate court in the case of death or incapacitation, and how to ensure seamless continued management of these assets in the most cost-effective and least stressful way. Specifically, Samantha will review the advantages of having and holding title to real property and trust. And with that, I will turn it over to Samantha. Thank you, Jody. And again, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar series. Today, as uh, Jody mentioned, we're going, I'm gonna share information with you about the advantages of having a trust and why you wanna hold title to real property, specifically in a trust. Um, we are located in Tustin, California, for those of you who may not know. And we'll start here. So the first advantage of holding title to real estate in a trust is to avoid the probate court in two different situations. The first situation is where uh, the first situation is upon somebody having diminished capacity. So it's during their lifetime when they start showing signs of dementia or Alzheimer's or some other type of diminished capacity. And if you don't have, a, if this person does not have a trust, durable power of attorney and advanced healthcare directive in place, oftentimes they're gonna require a conservator to be appointed by the court. A conservatorship proceeding for those who may not know is a legal proceeding where the court needs to appoint a person or persons to manage the personal health care and financial decisions for a person who does not have capacity. It is oftentimes needed when people do not have these estate planning documents in place because there's nobody who can make decisions or sign legal documents on their behalf once they have diminished capacity. So conservatorship proceedings, as you can see on the slide, um, range range drastically in, in value and price. Um, the cheapest I've ever done one is about $5,000, and that's just to get the client appointed as the conservator. Um, the, it's, it's expensive because it takes a lot of time to fill out the court paperwork, and then you need to pay the filing fees to the court, which can range from $500 to $1,000 just for the initial filing fee. Um, also, a probate uh, investigator or public defender is oftentimes assigned to the case, and these people can also be entitled to payment from the person's estate. Um, the minimum of $5,000 to obtain a conservatorship is only if there are no problems. If everyone in the family agrees that mom or dad has diminished capacity and would benefit from having a conservator being appointed, then there will not be any objections to the petition and the um, fees and court costs can stay to a minimum. However, oftentimes in our experience, you know, somebody will not agree in the family, right? Brother will say, mom has capacity. Sister will say, no, she doesn't have capacity. Um, so they will not agree that mom needs a conservator. So there'll be an objection there. Or they will not agree as to who should be appointed as the conservator. So these, um, when there's an objection, the next step is trial and evidentiary hearings. And, you know, we've had cases that have upward of $100,000 to you know, $300,000 in attorney's fees and court filing fees. All of this can be avoided by having those documents in place. 
Um, the advanced healthcare directive, which I mentioned, also called a healthcare power of attorney. It avoids the conservatorship of the person. So that's for healthcare decisions and where they're going to live and their daily and regular care and maintenance needs. Um, a trust avoids the conservatorship of the estate when assets are held in a trust or for trust assets. Um, power of attorney is going to avoid a conservatorship of the estate if for assets that are not held in a trust. So I have a few examples of when a conservatorship is needed. Um, one is on an emergency basis. So for example, we had a client who um, came in and their adult daughter recently suffered from a stroke. And this daughter of theirs does not have a spouse and does not have any children, just two living parents. And the stroke was so bad that she was on life support and a feeding tube and her parents wanted to pull the plug, so to speak, and let her die peacefully without having to be hooked up to the machines. Um, unfortunately, because she did not have an advanced healthcare directive in place, the hospital staff, you know, put their arms up and said, you know, you're going to need to get a conservatorship to, in order to, you know, allow your daughter to die peacefully without the machines. Um, so we did, we got an emergency base, uh, a conservatorship on an emergency basis, and they were able to carry out what they, what they understood their daughter's wishes to be, which was to, you know, not be on life support and feeding tubes. Um, again, this could be avoided had the, this person, had this, um, had the woman put together the advanced health care directive appointing mom and dad, and that document also has your wishes as to whether you want to, um, you know, be on life support or if you want to sort of pass peacefully if the doctors know that you're not going to recover fully. Another example of when a conservatorship is oftentimes needed is for property held in joint tenancy. A lot of people will tell me, um, they'll come into our office and they'll say, oh, we don't need a trust. We have our house in joint tenants, you know, husband and wife as joint tenants. It carries with it the right of survivorship, meaning that when one spouse passes away or one owner on title as a joint tenant passes away, the title will automatically be confirmed or will pass to the other joint tenant, right? That's the right of survivorship. Um, so a lot of people will say, you know, we're, we're perfectly protected. If my husband dies, then the property will be mine and I won't need to go through probate and if wife dies, vice versa. Well, that might be true. And that is a, you know, a strategy that a risky strategy to go with. Um, I, we have a recent client who sadly his husband and wife are on title to a home and several joint bank accounts. The wife is diagnosed with dementia and now she's living in a boarding care facility. So the husband at this point is unable to do anything with his real estate, with their real estate, or their joint accounts until the court appoints him as a conservator. Um, in this court proceeding, the court is going to take jurisdiction over all of their assets. So, so this includes 100% of their home and all of the joint assets, that uh, joint accounts that they're on. All of this um, can be avoided had husband and wife formed a trust and transferred the home and their assets to the trust. Um, or if she had a durable power of attorney that would allow him to sign on her behalf and transfer her share of the property into a trust. Um, then there could be problems with a power of attorney document. Um, you know, when we form a trust and transfer title to the trust, we actually are severing the joint tenancy at that time. So this means that when the property is held by two or more people in a joint tenancy, Upon one of their deaths, as I just explained, their interest passes sort of to the survivor of them. Now, in the joint tenancy situation, if this occurs, um, a portion of the property, 50% in this example, of it's husband and wife as joint tenants, 50% of the property is going to get a step up in basis or a partial step up in basis. Basis is um, the cost value of what you paid for an asset. So it's your, um, you know, the, the cost for that asset, what you paid for it. So when the second of the spouses pass, um, you know, the, the, the first spouse had the first step up in basis and then the second spouse passes away, the property is going to get a second step up in basis. So holding title to this property in a trust does away with this double step up in basis. Um, it's typically going to result in the owners and their heirs and beneficiaries paying a lot less capital gains when they sell the property upon the second person's death. Um, and I'll go into more of the, the, the specifics of step up and basis and capital gains tax advantages in a, in a few slides. So these tax, tax advantages are even more important and valuable here in California when real estate is such a crown jewel asset. 
and it's typically the most expensive asset that most people own. Um, so the problems with the power of attorney document, um, you know, sometimes people will only have a power of attorney without a trust, and this can sometimes prevent a conservatorship if, if they were to lose capacity. But it is not the best practice, and it's not typically advisable. Um, there can be problems with the POA, such, that, such as it not being specific enough. For example, I received a call from a gentleman whose mother has been diagnosed with dementia. She owns a home in her individual name and not in a trust, unfortunately. He does have a power of attorney for her, um, and he wants to either sell the home or obtain a loan against it using the equity to allow him to continue paying for her board and care facility for the rest of her lifetime. If the power of attorney is not specific enough in that it does not give son a right to form a trust for mom, um, then he's probably gonna need a conservatorship. Unless, of course, if mom still has some capacity to be able to meet with us, um, you know, tell us the extent of her property and her family and communicate to us her wishes and, and where, what she wants, who she wants to be in charge and where she wants her assets to go, um, then, then we can't plan a document for her. So the conservatorship would probably be necessary in this situation unless that power of attorney is very specific. And you know, a lot of times people are downloading these powers of attorney and advanced healthcare directives offline definitely not a uh, do-it-yourself project. Don't, don't try to DIY it. Um, you want to make sure that you're working with an attorney and that they understand all of your desires to, to what you want to do with those assets. Um, so our state plans do include the powers of attorney and advanced health care directives because it's a complete plan with the best and strongest protection for you. Um, so it's most advisable for property owners to set up a trust early and have it reviewed by an attorney every five to 10 years, long before capacity becomes an issue. So competent attorneys will oftentimes not be able to prepare documents for someone who is already showing signs of diminished capacity. So our firm also practices trust litigation, which oftentimes results if any heir or beneficiary, right, a child or um, a grandchild, makes a claim that the property owner did not have capacity to prepare that trust or was unduly influenced to make the trust document. You know, so, so we have to be very careful as trust and estate planning attorneys to, you know, make sure that we're protecting the person who's creating the trust by not opening up to potential claims like this. And also, you know, it's, it's really protection for their family as well. So again, um, in, a, in a perfect world, you know, all siblings are going to get along, but sadly, in our experience, this is only the case in about 1% of the time, maybe. Um, so if, if you have a good relationship with your siblings, definitely cherish that and, and try to keep that as long as possible. So um, another thing, I, well, I, I will move on here to the next one. Okay, so the second reason or the second way that the trust is going to protect you is upon your death. So the first one's during your lifetime, avoid conservatorship. Second one here is upon your death, you want to avoid the probate court proceeding. Um, here in California, anybody who has assets that exceed a value of $166,250 um, will have to have their estate probated. So that's very modest low amount here in California, especially considering all of the or the very high prices of real estate. Um, so minimum fees in California for attorneys and the person administering the estate called the executor is going to be on a $600,000 estate is my example here, it'd be $30,000. And that's a statutory figure that's that's determined by the probate code. Um, it's actually a sliding scale, the attorney and the executor get the same amount. So here, the beneficiaries in a probate for with, that has assets of $600,000, um, the beneficiaries are going to receive at least a $30,000 haircut off the top. You know, the executor has the ability to waive their fees, right, if they're a sole beneficiary or beneficiary of the estate. Um, but the attorney, the, those are the minimum fees, statutory fees. Attorneys can also charge and, and, and be paid extraordinary fees, which um, are justified and ordered by the court in the event we're selling property or for in litigation or if you know we have a real messy probate to deal with, then extraordinary fees can be awarded. Um, so those are just the fees, the statutory fees. Minimum cost for a probate, I would estimate that at about 1500 and that's on the very, very low end. Um, I, I estimated this because we got filing fees of about $500. So 
service fees, copies, and postage. Then we have probate referee fees, you know, about $500. The probate referee um, is assigned by the court, and their role is to give basically a desktop appraisal of all the assets that are in the estate. And they get paid, the probate referee gets paid a percentage on the entire gross value of the assets that they're appraising. So again, if we have a $600,000 estate, your probate referee fees are gonna be about $500, $600, um, There's a lot of delays in the probate court. So initially, just to get a person appointed, even if a person has a will and they say, you know, I, Sarah, want my sister, Diane, to be my executor of my will. Um, a will is not a self-executing document, like a trust. So the, the, uh, the example here, I think her name was Sarah, the, the sister is going to be filing, the executor is going to file the petition and the will with the court and ask the court to be appointed. The court's going to set a hearing on that petition that is about four to six months out. And in that interim period, in the four to six months, um, the executor or the identified executor has absolutely no authority to do anything on behalf of the estate. They cannot get into bank accounts. They cannot uh, sell assets. They cannot refinance reverse mortgages. Um, you know, they, they can't do anything. Their hands are basically tied until the court appoints them as being the executor. So that has caused, in, in my experience, a lot of problems with lo homes losing equity. Um, you can imagine if, you know, the estate administrator can't get into the decedent's accounts where the mortgage payments were being made, um, the mortgage is continuing to become due every month, and um, oftentimes this will revolt, result in notices of default being recorded, notices of sale, and then we have to go in on an emergency basis to try to get the, the executor appointed in a, in, more quickly. Um, and then the minimum amount of time for a probate. So that's after, it's about four to six months to get the executor appointed. After the executor is appointed, then the entire probate proceeding is gonna take about 12 to 24 months. And this is, um, this, this whole time to get the probate you know, done and, and finished is a big problem because it, it's, like, it's a problem that got exacerbated by COVID-19 court closures. So it was taking probably about 12 to 18 months, and now it's, I would say, you know, on the longer end of 24 months to get most probates done. Uh, of course, it de determines or it depends on, you know, how quick the attorney is catching probate notes and filing supplements and staying on top of, you know, clearing any deficiencies through those probate notes. Um, but, you know, the delays cause a lot of problems. You, on the slide here, you know, you can't, the administrator won't be able to protect and preserve assets and um, again, you're, you're risking notices of default and foreclosure proceedings on, on real estate. So this compared to having a trust, when if you have a trust and the assets held in the trust, say the real estate's in the trust, the trustee can begin working to administer the trust and dealing with the property within just a few days of a person's death. Um, so so it's, it's a seamless transition of management from the deceased person to the successors who are then responsible for, you know, managing the trust for the benefit of the beneficiaries. In a probate, all the beneficiaries have to wait to receive their inheritance. They have to wait till the end of the probate proceeding is done. So in, in here in this example, it's going to be a 12 to 24 months before they receive any assets of the probate court of the probate estate. And that is because the executor cannot make any preliminary distributions. The court uh, has to order and approve the administrator to make distributions to the beneficiaries. Again, this differs very much from having a trust where a trustee has the authority to make preliminary distributions um, without needing the court's authority. In a trust situation, if that trustee needs to sell real estate, um, the successor trustee can get it listed within a few days in a probate court proceeding, there's going to be that four to six month delay just to get the property listed. And this is the same result, not just for real property, but other types of assets, such as stocks, bonds, investments, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the administrator's hands are tied until the court says, yes, you may act. Um, and then, you know, the, and then in a trust, it's, it's a seamless transition of management again. Um, one more sort of risk of the probate court and dragging assets through the probate court and not having a trust is, you know, when a person passes away without a trust or only having a will, 
all of their creditors are going to be required to receive notice of their death, and then they all have an opportunity to make claims against the state. These are called creditor claims. Most of the debts have priority to be paid under the probate code um, before the beneficiaries receive any distributions at all. So as you can see, this means that there is a possibility that the beneficiaries did not receive any inheritance at all if the decedent passed away with significant debts and creditors knocking on the door. Um, so this is why this, this debt problem and this notice to creditor problem is a reason why sometimes we advise people who might have you know, limited assets or may not even own real estate, but if they have a lot of debts, that's sometimes advisable for them to create a trust. You know, for example, one of our clients had um, cancer and she had a lot of medical bills and um, a lot of debts from that. Or we have another client with a very large IRS tax lien. Um, even though these people might not have a lot of assets, it's still advisable to put the trust in place because um, you can avoid that mandatory notice to creditors and you can negotiate down these debts without them having the right to, to file in the probate court. One last problem with probate that I'll mention is that when the decedent doesn't even have a will at all, um, so obviously no trust and, and no will, they're gonna be in the probate court. And if, if they have not been able to direct how their assets should be distributed, they go by the default rule, which is that all heirs and beneficiaries are gonna receive their distributions outright. Unless they're minors, typically the probate court's gonna want it to go into a, a blocked account until that minor turns 18. But this can be very problematic if this beneficiary has drug or alcohol issues or special needs. And again, if they have a lot of creditors. Um, if, if you put together a trust, then this allows you to customize your desires so that your heirs and beneficiaries who may not receive money outright um, or might not benefit them to receive money outright don't. Um, and instead, a special needs trust could be formed for the people with disabilities or who are on government assistance benefits who want to keep them and not get disqualified. Um, and, and the trust also allows the creator to put in some prerequisites to receiving distributions, such as age, you know, getting an education or being sober. Um, these are protections that can be put in place in a customized trust and estate plan. So I wanted to stop to see if we have any questions. Um, looks like we have a few in the chat. Um, one chat question I'll answer says, the client of mine has, uh, has created a trust through LegalZoom. What are your thoughts on LegalZoom? That's a very good question. I get that a lot, actually. Um, LegalZoom is not a great option for somebody with, you know, having uh, owning a home, anybody with, with assets. It's really not a good plan to go with it because you know, you're not having the advice and the expertise of being able to talk to an attorney. You know, the, the, whole, the whole idea of working with an attorney to do your estate plan is to troubleshoot, issue spot, give you referrals to other attorneys or other professionals that you should probably be talking to, um, and to make sure that you know, it's all, um, that your whole estate plan accomplishes whatever your goals are. Right. If, if you have a document that's off LegalZoom, I, I believe you sort of check a few boxes and, and a document's generated and, you know, you might not even, even really understand what's all in there. Um, one thing we do offer that I'll mention is a free trust review. So if your client wanted to, if, you know, if somebody has a LegalZoom trust and if they wanted us to review it, they can bring it into our office or email it to us and we can have a call or a meeting to sort of review the document and discuss what their true wishes and desires are. Um, and then if it's not matching up, we can amend or restate or just revoke the old trust and start over. Any other questions? I have one more question. Um, will you still have to go to probate if you are married? Yes, um, depending on how the assets are held, right? So again, with the joint tenancy, say you own a joint account um, it's a Bank of America account and husband passes away, wife will automatically remain on title of that account. Now, again, in that example, if, if one of them were to lose capacity um, and the bank is not able to, you know, remove that person's name from the account unless they can sign a document saying, yes, I, you know, I'm closing this account. 
Um, in that situation, you're going to probably need a conservatorship. Um, and, and that's again, the, the very expensive and time consuming court proceeding. Um, conservatorships also, I, I don't know that I mentioned are a lifetime commitment. So while the person who needs to be conserved is living their whole, the whole duration of their life, um, the, the conservator who is appointed by the court will continue having to do annual and biannual reporting to the court, um, requiring again, more attorney's fees, court filing fees, and just a lot more expense and time. Uh, good question. I have another question here. When would a person want to create an irrevocable trust or account? Um, that's a good question. An irrevocable trust, there's a lot of different types of irrevocable trusts. Um, we do those as well, and it really depends on what their specific goals are. You know, there's one type of irrevocable trust that I like a lot if people have a lot of real estate. Um, you know, if they, they have a lot of real estate and maybe not a lot of cash to pass on to their um, successors or their beneficiaries and heirs, they want to consider putting together an irrevocable insurance trust. Um, the reason for this is that, you know, the, the trust itself can actually get the insurance policy and it will be on the property owner's, you know, lifetime. Um, when that property owner passes away, there's going to be, you know, there, there, there's a potential of having a very large estate tax um, bill and that that the idea of the life insurance in that irrevocable trust is that that life insurance is paid out to pay off the taxes so that the real estate doesn't have to be sold to pay the tax bill. Um, that's one of them. I mean, we do charitable remainder trusts as well, where, you know, somebody might not need an asset, um, the principal of an asset, typically a real property, um, and they will transfer it to an irrevocable trust. And um, with, the, with the beneficiaries, the first beneficiaries of all the income, you know, if it's a rental property, the owner can actually, the owner and his family, his or her family, can receive the income during the rest of their lifetime. And then once the, you know, the, the owner and their family members or kids pass away, then that asset is donated upon death or at a specific time. And obviously that will help reduce their estate tax amount by the charitable gift amount. Good question. Okay, so I will continue. Just feel free to put more questions in that chat box and we will keep going. Okay, so the second sort of advantage of passing or advantage of holding title to real estate in a trust is getting a very important tax benefit called the step up in basis upon death. So I kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, I will kind of backtrack here for a second and I want to explain what basis is for those who may not know. Um, basis is your cost value of an asset. So it's what you pay for the asset. And capital gain is, or loss, is the difference between your basis value, right, the purchase price, and the amount that you get in a sale, the sale price. So it could either be a loss or a gain, depending on if the property appreciated or depreciated. You can think of this as the net gain, which subtracts your cost from the gross sale proceeds. Um, so in this example that I have here on the screen, I want to sort of walk through what that means. What, this, what is the step up in basis and why is it so beneficial? So here in this example, mom's basis value in this property that she bought in 1980 is $100,000. Um, if mom sells this asset during her lifetime, say the property now in 2020, it's, um, uh, it's appreciated to a million dollars. Now, if mom sells the property here in 2020 for a million dollars, she's going to have gain, um, the capital gain of $900,000. Now, if mom's living in the property for the last two out of the five years, or if she has a husband living with her for the last two of the five years, there's a chance that they, you know, each person could have a $250,000 ex exclusion amount um, to protect that much of equity um, or that much of gain. But if mom's in a dementia care facility or a boarding care facility and she hasn't lived in the home for, for two to five years, then she doesn't get that $250,000 extra. And um, again, the gain is going to be about $900,000 in this example. Um, so if mom sells the, the property during her lifetime, she has $900,000 of gain to report to the IRS and she's going to pay 20% tax on that $900,000 gain. Um, of course, assuming that she doesn't have the, the other exemptions. Um, and, and that's only if it's a primary resident. So how you can avoid this is if the property is held in trust and if instead of selling the property during her lifetime, 
um, mom is able to pass the property on to her kids or her beneficiaries and you know identified identified beneficiaries upon her death and the reason is because upon mom's death say she passes in you know 2020 and the property value is one million dollars um, the, the the asset gets what's called the step up in basis meaning that the basis value mom's basis value is goes away completely and the trust or the beneficiary's basis value becomes the date of death value. So here in this example, the date of death value of mom died in 2020 um, becomes $1 million. And so if her kids or her successors were to sell the property, you know, within a couple of days, um, they're going to pay $0 in capital gains. So it's a huge tax advantage um, that a lot of people don't know about or fully understand. You know, I, I have um, a lot of people who come in and they say, oh, you know, I don't need to trust. I'm just going to add my son to title while I'm living and uh, that'll that'll take care of it. You definitely don't want to do that. I'm going to go over a couple more reasons in the next slide, but um, you're going to destroy or at least limit that capital gains tax benefit, which can be pretty substantial. So these are a few other ideas or these are a few other reasons why you should not be adding children or other people to title while you're living. Um, you know, there's there's title issues. Basically anyone on title, all persons on title can sell or encumber um, their share of the property, right? So if you have two joint tenants or tenants in common and you add son, you know, maybe son needs money that day um, and he sells his share of the property to Joe down the street. Well, now mom owns the property 50% with, you know, Joe down the street. Um, so, so you don't want to add anyone to, to title because they can sell the property out from under you or at least a share of it. Creditor claims are another people, another reason why you do not want to add children or other people to title during your lifetime. Um, you people on title may be subject to creditor claims, putting the home and the equity of the home at risk. Um, so I have an example of a case where a woman had passed away and she said basically in her trust, she did have a trust, 50% of uh, my share, she had a 50% interest. So her 50% share was devised or bequested to her two children with each getting 25%. Um, the moment they were put on title, the uh, judgment creditor of the daughter found, found the transaction and they recorded a 10 year, I think it was a nine year old judgment lien against the property, you know, to the tune of about $15,000. That was from an old credit card bill that she completely forgot about. Um, so we were selling the property and she actually had to pay, uh, you know, the creditor had to get paid through escrow. So her share of the estate was, you know, um, less by, by the amount of that judgment. Um, so that could have been avoided had, you know, the trust just said sell the property outright and distribute the income, right? Because had the property never hit daughter's name um, and instead if the trust said, you know, if the trust was better, um, then that could have been avoided. Another reason we don't add beneficiaries to title during our lifetimes is because of divorce claims. If a child goes through a divorce, the court, the family court, is required to divide all the party's assets. So if a son or daughter is on title, the home can actually be treated as that child's asset for support calculations in the family law matter. So a family law judge is probably not going to understand or necessarily care um, that the act of adding son or daughter to title was actually just a shortcut to estate planning and, and putting together a trust. Um, they're probably going to require uh, that asset to be counted for calculation purposes for support and um, might even require the property be sold to pay you know, the, the spouse that, that is entitled to payment, that may be entitled to payment. And I know a lot of parents think that their ch children will never get a divorce, but you know, with divorce rates as high as 50%, it's really not worth the risk in adding children to title. Um, and holding title in a trust, again, just avoids this altogether. Uh, the last sort of reason is bankruptcy claims. So if you add your son or daughter to title, we actually had a case like this, um, and the child files for bankruptcy, that bankruptcy court and that bankruptcy trustee um, may be entitled to his or her share of the home. So in this <clears throat> case that we had, excuse me. So in this case that we had, um, son was added to title because mom 
um, you know, just wanted him to have the property when she passed away. And then son racked up some debt, filed for bankruptcy, and the bankruptcy trustee actually took the entire property, even though son was only on 50%, and wrapped it up in the bankruptcy proceeding, and she couldn't do anything about it. Um, she actually was then required to pay uh, the bankruptcy trustee, I think, about $100,000 just to get her own property back. Um, so basically, she had to buy out her son's interest in her own property um, because she made the mistake of adding him during, during her lifetime. And again, I, I, I did go through sort of at the last slide, the income tax problems with a step up in basis, probably being one of the most valuable. Um, the last reason I want to, or the last advantage that I wanted to go over today is for those of you uh, who might have um, rental properties or whose clients or customers have rental properties. You know, we typically advise that rental properties should be held in an LLC, a limited liability company. Um, and then we assign the membership interest or the ownership interest in that LLC back to the trust. Um, you know, the reasons why we do it in the trust is for liability protection. First and foremost, you, um, if anyone is hurt or if they, anyone has a slip and fall on your rental property or if they are bitten by a dog, which is more common than you may think, um, they are going to look, the injured person is going to look towards your personal assets, right? The owner's personal assets. Holding the property and the title in an LLC um, is going to limit that person's, the injured person's ability to go after your own personal assets. Um, if the LLC is formed correctly and managed correctly as a business, um, and there's no commingling or anything like that or a reason to pierce, that, pierce the corporate veil, um, the injured person is going to be limited to the assets of the LLC, which is that, typically that property. Um, sometimes people will want to hold you know, multiple rental properties in one LLC, and typically we advise against that. Um, it's best to have one rental property per LLC. Another reason why we want to form typically LLCs for rental properties is that you get the great advantage of having um, a greater ability to deduct business tax deductions and also to depreciate your, um, your business deductions. So I have a chart here or sort of an example of a cash flow, you know, a rental income, $20,000. These are the things that you get to write off um, if you have a business and if you're operating it like a business. And then you also get to depreciate the asset over time. So we don't do, um, you know, we're not CPAs, but we have referrals to really great CPAs. So, you know, that's another, that's another uh, really great thing about working with an attorney is again, they connect you with the professionals who are more experienced in this, in this tax area, which would be, you know, our CPA partners. So quickly, our estate plans include um, typically these documents or a variety of these documents, you know, not every estate plans made the same. So I kind of went through some, some more of our common examples. The first is the trust, of course. It's a probate avoidance revocable trust. Um, we, we do form irrevocable trusts as well, like I said, but this is typically for um, the, bare, the bare basic minimum, right? Anyone with assets that exceed a value of 166,250 need to have a trust or they will be uh, wrapped up in the probate court either upon their incapacitation or death. The certification of trust is just a summary of the trust document. Um, it's included in our state plans when we, when we put the trust in there because it's the titling instrument. It's how you um, open a trust bank account. It's how you, you know, work with realtors or lenders to deal with trust property, you know, a, a real estate asset that's held in trust. So it's a really good, um, it's a really great document that we include in there. A pour over will or a living will um, if we're forming a trust for somebody, each of the spouses or each of the people forming the trust uh, will have a pour over will, meaning that um, the, the will says, if there are any assets outside of my trust upon my death, then the pour over will says, pour those assets into the trust so that the terms of the trust can control. And again, so those assets can avoid probate court. Um, a living will or a last will and testament as a lot of, as it's referred to as well, um, is for when we don't have a trust in the estate plan. The living will is not a self-executing document like the trust. So again, you, you have to go to probate court to have the executor appointed, and then the executor has to you know, go through the process of the probate court in order to eventually be able to distribute the assets. Advanced healthcare directives with HIPAA authorizations. These are for medical decisions, and it's imperative that basically anybody over the age of 18 should have the advanced health care directive and a durable power of attorney. 
And it looks like I didn't make the durable power attorney on here, but that would be typically next. Um, durable power attorney is for finances, again, for non-trust assets. And the advanced healthcare directive is for healthcare decisions. Um, the guardianship nomination is for our clients with kids who are under the age of 18. Anytime we have minors that we're planning, um, that are involved in a state plan that we're planning, we always recommend doing a guardianship nomination in the event, you know, both parents were to pass away, then this is those parents joint nomination of who they want to be, you know, in charge and the guardian of their kids when they pass away. Having this document can typically prevent a guardianship proceeding or it will at least um, streamline the guardianship proceeding significantly. Um, you know, if, if the court requires them to be appointed as guardian, they might have to petition the court, but they would have, you know, this written document that's notarized with, with your testamentary wishes or the parents' wishes as to who they want to be in charge. Assignment of personal property. Um, we do a bunch of different assignments. We assign everything to the trust that you have. So if you have timeshares, we're going to, you know, typically do an assignment. Sometimes timeshares, the owner will actually hold a deed um, and we can do deed transfers as well for timeshares if you want to keep them. Some of my clients are like, oh, I hate my timeshare. Really got to get rid of it. So, um, you know, if you like it, you can transfer it to your trust and so your kids can keep, keep it upon your passing if they want. Um, assignment of shares for corporation or membership interest in LLC. It's very important that if you have a corporation, if you have an LLC, you need to assign your ownership interest to your trust. It is the only way that, um, well, it's, it's one of the ways that you can avoid a probate of the business. Um, you know, a sole proprietorship, you, you don't have that option. So a sole proprietorship is always going to have to be probated. Um, a lot of people don't understand that. And that's, that's one of the huge benefits about putting, you know, your, your business into a, uh, forming a legal entity to, to run your business because, you know, you can have successor owners and co-owners who can get into those business bank accounts and deal with those business assets if anything were to happen to you. Um, whereas, you know, the, the sole proprietorship doesn't have that option. The sole proprietorship um, owner or whoever's, you know, dealing with the, the executor um, has to wait and, and can't get into the bank accounts, you know, can't run the business, can't sell the inventory until the court authorizes it. Grant deeds. So gr deeds are to transfer title of real estate. So we'll do a grant deed for every real estate, um, you know, piece, uh, every real estate property that somebody has. Um, and we record those with the preliminary change of ownership report. That's a really important prop, uh, document that gets sent to the county assessor. And the preliminary change of ownership report needs to be filled out correctly. Otherwise, your property taxes are going to go up. Um, so make sure that that is done with an attorney if you're recording any deeds. And then funding instructions are basically just instructions to our clients to keep in their trust binder. And it goes over every single asset under the sun that you could ever imagine and how to take title of that asset in the name of your trust. So uh, setting up a trust with us um, is a very simple process to get started. We do most of it on a flat fee arrangement, which is nice. You know exactly how much you're um, paying up front. You pay half up front, half at the end. You know, we have an in-house notary, so the notary fees are all uh, tied up into our, or included in our flat fees. Um, it's a three to five week turnaround unless it's an emergency. Typically we you know, we'll have a, a call and then a week later check in and make sure we get all the final answers. And then, um, you know, a week later we can, we can sign the documents just depending on all of our schedules and availability. Um, and again, the process is very simple. It takes maybe two or three calls or meetings. So, um, you know, if, if some, some clients require a little bit more handholding and, and we definitely offer that as well, but most of our clients, you know, it's like going to the dentist, I kind of say, you know, going to your estate planning attorney is, Kind of like going to the dentist, you don't want to go, um, but after you go, you feel great that you went and now you don't have to do it again for, you know, a while. <laughs> much longer on the dentist than, or much longer on the estate planning than the dentist. And then I wanted to go in a little bit about we, who we are. Um, again, as Jody mentioned, I've been practicing for about five and a half years and I've been with the firm for about um, three and a half years, so almost four. Um, primarily practice in the areas of estate planning, probate, and trust litigation. Um, I grew up in the city of Orange, so right down the street from our office here in Tustin. And I went to Chapman University, so um, stayed very local. Noelle Minto is the founder of the firm. She has over 16 years of experience in trust and business law. Um, she is 
her, the motto of the firm I wanted to share is where trust and business law intersect. And that means, I mean, what we find is, you know, the, the administration of a trust is, is pretty similar to the administration of a business. And, you know, having this expertise and having her ability to um, understand the ins, ins and outs of the businesses and also, you know, in and out of the probate code and, and the trust law um, really is like a one stop shop for a lot of our clients. Um, but we do work with a lot of business attorneys as well um, in tandem, you know, business litigation or business administration. Um, and then this is John Trader. He is our senior litigation attorney. He has over 38 years of trial experience and um, heads up our litigation department, which I am also helping, which I also help with. Um, another sort of motto of our firm is that we're your family's law firm. And this is what we mean. What we mean is, you know, we're going to be around for a long time. We are going to have copies of your documents. So you don't have to worry about, you know, your estate planning attorney going out of business. Um, and you don't have to worry about your estate planning attorney not having originals, you know, signed documents in their files. We keep all signed documents, you know, that we, that we prepare. Um, and we'll be here for, you know, our, our clients' kids and grandkids. You know, uh, we really kind of represent families um, as a whole rather than just, you know, uh, some parents, right? And then we, we involve the kids a lot um, towards the end of life decisions and administration as well. So this is our contact information. Please contact our team at NM Law. If you have any questions, we offer a free consultation. If uh, you have any clients or referrals for us, um, we would be happy to speak with them. Thanks for joining. I have a few questions I can get to. So the, somebody's asked what the minimum fee charge is for setting up a trust and ancillary documents for a basic trust where husband and wife and one successor trustee with one property. So yes, that does sound like a rather simple estate plan. Um, our, our fees range anywhere from you know, 2,500 to 4,500 depending on the specifics. If it's a basic trust document, it's gonna be you know, towards the lower end of that or basic estate plan. Um, what we do, always look for is, you know, things that they haven't thought about yet. You know, do they have that corporation? Do they have that LLC? You know, the minor children, um, does any of their children have special needs where we should take extra precautions with that? Um, you know, but, but a simple trust, it would be on the lower end of that scale. And um, again, we do everything flat fee. So typically in the consultation, we can learn, you know, everything that we need to know um, to basically quote a more concrete fee at that time. I have another good question here. What's the best way to deal with student loan debt? And so student loan debt is, depends on what this debt is. Um, my student loans are with the federal government. So federal government has priority over, um, you know, everything. <laughs> they're gonna get paid at the end, to, they're gonna get paid no matter what. Um, so it depends what who they're with. If it's a private, private um, you know, if it's a private, uh, loan servicer and your loans are private loans, then there is definitely the ability to negotiate. One thing I will mention is um, children are not responsible for debts of their parents. Spouses are responsible for the debts of their deceased spouse. So, um, you know, if a husband has student loans and the wife does not, and the husband were to pass away, there is a chance, um, at least maybe if it was a credit card bill, it's going to be a definitely that wife's going to be responsible for the credit card bill. Um, student loan, I would have to check on that. I'm not quite sure how, if that would be a responsibility of the wife, but I tend to think it would. Um, now, it's a very different situation if the, um, say, a father has a credit card debt of $20,000 and he does not have a spouse and he passes away. Um, the children can typically call the creditors and explain that their father has died. You know, they're, they're not going to be filing for probate. Um, he did not have a spouse and ask the creditors to charge off the debt. So we've been pretty successful with that um, as long as it's not a, a debt of the community. That's a good question. Um, can you transfer Prop 13 property tax basis amount to your, to your children or is the property reassessed at the fair market value? Really good question. So I did not go into property taxes too much, but I'm happy to touch on that. Um, so property taxes, um, Prop 13 basically says that 
the assessed value of the property, right? Anytime there's a sale of property, it's going to be reassessed as of that date of the transaction, typically, unless an exclusion applies. Um, and what Prop 13 does, which we get in here to enjoy here in California, is it says that each year, you know, your property tax cannot increase by an amount that's over 2%. So if you paid, you know, $500,000 for your property in year 2000, um, in year 2021, it, the most it can increase is 2%. Now, when you're passing title um, to somebody, when it's a sale or you're adding people to property title or removing them to property title, the county is going to want to reassess, but we submit the preliminary change of ownership report and oftentimes a claim for a reassessment exclusion. Um, there's a bunch of different exclusions that apply. One I will mention, or a few I'll mention, is um, when, you're prop when you're transferring title from joint tenants into a trust that's for both people's benefit that's an exclusion. So there's no reassessment there as long as you fill out that preliminary change of ownership form correctly. And um, another exclusion is parent to children or grandparent to, to grandchild. Um, so if it's passing, you know, upon your death to your kid, you would again submit that claim for reassessment exclusion and you can keep their low property tax value. It's a huge benefit, especially here in California. And especially for people, you know, I have clients who have you know, bought their homes for $90,000 and now they're worth $800,000. Um, so that would be a huge property tax jump, you know, if, if that exclusion didn't apply. Um, so all these are really good questions that you would, you know, talk about with the estate planning attorney to make sure that, you know, your estate plan structured in a way where you're not going to run into those problems. Um, between spouses too is another one I'll mention that's really common. You know, if, if one spouse is coming off title in the event of a divorce or if, um, you're adding a new spouse to title, um, that's not reassessed either. It, it, it qualifies for an exclusion. Good question. So I think I've answered them all. Thank you all for your questions. Um, oh, I do have one more that is a good one. Is there an urgency to do this all now, get a trust done, considering the incoming administration um, and the election coming up? Uh, and, and the incoming administration may do away with the step up and other advantages currently in place. Yes, so the reason to do it now would be to see if you, um, if, for people who have large estates, you want to probably consider doing it before the election um, because the exemption amounts are so high. And once the new, the, the estate tax, the estate gift tax exemption amount is so high. So if the new administration comes in, if they lower that estate tax exemption amount, then your, you know, your trust, if you have one, or if you don't have a trust and you have assets that exceed the exemption amount, um, your estate's going to have to pay taxes, estate taxes, on any amount that's over the exemption amount. So yeah, very good question. It is a good idea to consider at least consulting now and, and seeing if it would be beneficial and advantageous to, to put together your, a plan now rather than waiting. Any other questions? I think I answered them all. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. It was very nice to see your faces, some of you, and we appreciate your time. Jody. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Samantha. And if you have any questions whatsoever, um, the on the confirmation email for the webinar, there's contact information. Samantha will also be following up with everyone who registered with a recording of today's webinar. In case you wanna to listen to it again, uh, she talked about a lot of things and we thank you all for being here and wish you all a wonderful uh, day and upcoming weekend. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.